In the criminal justice system, the people Pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address and men who don't care Are represented by two separate yet equally important groups A cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law, you're the fuzz, the heat, you're poison, you're trouble, you're bad news These are their stories There's a lot going on in U.S. courts. This just in from Phoenix, the Arizona Supreme Court ruling that the state can enforce a long dormant law that criminalizes all abortions except when a mother's life is at stake. Oh, man. The case examined whether the state is still subject to a law that predates Arizona's statehood. This is in 1864, this law, um... Uh, when to effect. No exceptions for rape or incest. Mm -hmm. Does allow abortions of a mother's life's in danger. The state's high court reviewed a 2022 decision by the state court of appeals that said that doctors couldn't be charged for performing the procedure in the first 15 weeks of pregnancy. But an older court decision blocked the enforcing of the 1864 law shortly after the U.S. Supreme Court issued that Roe v. Wade decision in 1973 that guaranteed a constitutional right to this procedure, right? So after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June of 2022, the state attorney general, Mark Brnovich, is a Republican, persuaded a state judge in Tucson to lift the block on enforcing the 1864 law. And that's what's happened in Arizona. It's astounding. Absolutely astounding. So, Attorney General Chris Mays had urged the state's high court to side with the Court of Appeals and hold the 1864 law in abeyance. In other words, don't allow this thing to go into effect. It was an 1864 law, and it was done even before we were a state in Arizona. Since the U.S. Supreme Court's 2022 decision ending a nationwide right to abortion, most Republican-controlled states have started enforcing new bans or restrictions, and most Democrat-dominated ones have sought to protect abortion access. There are 14 states that are enforcing bans on abortions at all stages of pregnancy with limited exceptions. Two states ban the procedure once cardiac activity can be detected, which is about six weeks into pregnancy, and often before women even realize they're pregnant. Nearly every ban has been challenged with a lawsuit. And courts have blocked enforcing some restrictions, including bans throughout pregnancy in Utah and Wyoming. I'm telling you, these Arizona folks better be careful because women are going to come out of the woodwork to vote to make sure the people that are putting the laws like this and, and, and enforcing them and keeping them, them on the books are voted out. I certainly hope that's true, and it's an awful way to have to get women to come out of the woodwork. It sure I is. will tell you that I felt strongly about this in the Supreme Court appointments in 2016 when Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump, and I thought, you know, you had, you've got an open seat on the Supreme Court, and it was held open to sort of communicate to a GOP voter base that you guys should come out of the woodwork and we can get that seat for us and we can reshape the high court and you'll get the things you want. Mm -hmm. You'll take away women's rights to choose. So they did. They, the GOP organized and a lot of fundamentalists organized. I'm talking about fundamentalist religious people. And they delivered that election in such a slim number also capitalizing on a lot of other externals please i don't mean to boil the whole thing down to that i mean uh, the lack of uh, hillary showing up in wisconsin the uh, you've got james comey the fbi director and serving up you know issues around those emails i mean you know the in the security of emails i mean that looks almost quaint compared to what was going on during the trump administration but anyway these all things all led to gop control Trump becomes president, and he populates the court in the way he has. So now, uh, as I say, I wish that we had seen a push that had reflected that open seat 
in 2016, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Sure. But if only we could turn back time. We didn't, and mm -hmm. we are. So Kim is certainly right, and as you know, if you've watched this show before or listened to the show before, you know I feel quite strongly that the abortion issue should show up as a state ballot measure on as many states as you can make it happen, and certainly in swing states. And that will propel a much greater turnout at the polls, and mm -hmm. as Kim has noted, it will propel a great turnout on the part of women, or it doesn't have to be women. Anybody who's got a brain in their head who wants women to have power over their own body. And so I do think that now with the abortion rights showing up as a ballot measure on more and more states, it is possible that, well, two things are possible. It's possible to enshrine women's rights state by state, which is the way it's going to have to be. And it's also possible in those swing states to beat back Donald Trump. And you could beat him pretty soundly. I mean, this is a, a real misstep. Uh, he has really not read the room. He read the room well to be able to get to the presidency because, as I mentioned, those constituencies that I talk about, they all showed up for him. Mm -hmm. But now the A word is a bad word for him. It's a reminder of what he did. And I want to talk to David K. Johnston about it, and I've got some... I've got but, the video that Trump out put put out. Go ahead, Kim. Just, Sorry, just what? yesterday he is reading the room because just yesterday he said, "Oh, we're going to make everybody happy. I'm going to negotiate something on abortion that's going to give a little candy to all the crowd." Right? He's he's reading the room now. I'm saying he's <laughs> we can't uh, he's forget. misread. Yeah, don't forget he's the reason we're in this boat in the first place. You can't fix it. You're the one who broke it. And so, so that's why I think his message on abortion, mm -hmm. which he put out, as you know, as a video, as a campaign video, and I'll run a bit of it when Albert gets here, uh, I, and we'll talk to David K. Johnston about it as well, it is a reminder, as Kim says, of what he did. And he even acknowledges it. He said, I got you what you wanted. We rolled back Roe v. Wade. And now my position is, and he's trying to have it both ways. Mm -mm. And the reality is, I think this is going to bite him hard. So that's where we sit on that. But that's a massive, massive ruling in the Arizona Supreme Court to enforce this long forgotten 1864 law criminalizing all abortions, except wow. when a mother's life is at stake. Meanwhile, in Michigan... The parents of that uh, school shooter in Michigan, Jennifer and James Crumbly, their son killed four people, each faced up to 15 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter convictions. They were sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. Their separate jury trials ended in guilty verdicts in February and March. That made them the first parents in the country to be convicted over the deaths caused by their child in a mass shooting. I will say their case is pretty egregious. I mean, they ignored the signs and bought them the gun. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, um, it seems, and you, you know, these poor families, you hear them in court, uh, it's a, um, it's an outrage that these weapons are so available. It's just, it's awful. And as was said in court, this tragedy was completely preventable. Yeah. If only they had done something, anything, to shift the course of events on November 30th, then our four angels would be here today. That was from the mother yeah. of Justin Schilling, 17 years old, who was killed in that shooting. She's exactly right. Her baby is gone because these people are irresponsible. That's right. Yeah. And, and go on and on. It's heartbreaking. And there's no getting it right and let them rot for 10 to 15 years. I'm sorry. Not sympathetic. TV star, as we continue with Law and Disorder, I'll give you something a little bit less. Um, at least there's no life hanging in the balance here. A TV star sheriff is accused of stealing $5 million in taxpayer money 
And what did this person do with $5 million in taxpayer money? Spent it on vacations, luxury cigars, and plastic surgery, everybody. I love it. He was a TV star sheriff from southern Indiana, now facing 25 felony charges, accused of stealing taxpayer money and blowing hundreds of thousands of dollars on vacations, luxury cigars, and plastic surgery. At least, at least this person didn't waste the money. Jamie Noel, 52, and his wife, Misty, 50, and their daughter, Casey, 27, charged after authorities found that they had spent as much as $5 million dollars on credit cards that Mr. Noel had opened in the name of the nonprofit agency that he ran. Hmm. Ooh, it's a wild idea, but it just might work. <laughs> nope. Well, search, war- search, search warrants revealed that the trio had blown more than $300,000 on vacations and travel, $200,000 on tuition and college expenses, $56,000 on cigars. Wow, I mean, that's a, I don't know where you're getting your cigars, but good for you. What? What? And twenty-five thousand dollars on a small plane. They're also accused of spending money on cosmetic procedures, tanning, clothing, and vape products. Well, oh, I got to say, I mean, uh, there is a picture of them in court. Not a bad-looking couple. Um, too bad they didn't have a little more money set aside for the plastic <laughs> surgery. That's all I'm saying. I yeah. All three members have pleaded not guilty. And finally, in Law and Disorder, I have a pair of cruise ship stories. We take you into courtrooms. We take you into the significant cases. We take you to the streets. And we take you to the high seas in Law and Disorder. And here, it's the latter. A cruise passenger, 23 years old, fell overboard and vanished after complaining that he felt seasick. The recently wed student had just texted his wife that he felt seasick. Liam Jones vanished during a seven-day Northern Europe tour cruise. The social work student from Scotland last seen on board by his sister shortly after texting his wife about feeling seasick. The cruise line confirming that a passenger went missing during the cruise, prompting an investigation. I'm devastated, the wife said. I have so many questions. I'm not getting any answers to what happened. There isn't a lot known, Kim. Yeah. In 2023, at least 10 people fell off a major cruise line ship. Uh -uh. So it's not something that happens all the time, but it is something that does happen. You took a cruise. I I did. did did I stay stay away from the railing, Kim. Right, exactly. I stay away. Mm -hmm. I'm a... Afraid of heights anyway, as you're aware. (laughs) And this isn't all, Kim. I'm glad you're seated for this. A 20-year-old man is missing after jumping off a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. What? That's right. On purpose? Now, this guy... I'm sorry? He he did it on purpose? Please don't interrupt Lawn Disorder, Kim, when I'm trying to get the story out. I'm sorry. All right, yeah. (laughs) Um, My bad. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Royal Caribbean confirming that a passenger whose identity, identity not re, uh, is revealed went overboard near the Bahamas at about 4 a.m. on Thursday last week. Has been missing since. The U.S. Coast Guard launched a search for the passenger. A spokesperson for Royal Caribbean said that the care team, as they're called, is providing support and assistance to the guest's <laughs> family during this difficult time. Brian Sims, who's a fellow cruise passenger, said that he'd hung out with the passenger in the hot tub until 3.30 in the morning. Sounds fun. The man appeared to be pretty (laughs) drunk, is what he says. I'd be willing to bet my lunch that there's alcohol involved. I just told you that there's alcohol involved, so I don't think think we're taking bets. Stumbling around near the railing, that's a bad bet. But this is what happened. There's kind of a twist here. Also... After leaving the hot tub, they encountered the passenger's father, and the dad was angry at him for being drunk. Another passenger on board the cruise, Deborah Morrison, said 
there was a lot of yelling. And the crew was alerted that there was so much yelling. The uh, Apparently, uh, he just took off, jumped out. It was unclear. Oh, no. One report said he jumped out a window. That doesn't really make sense. But two passengers missing. And oh, no. now this is an immense cruise ship. It has 18 decks and can accommodate up to 3,600 passengers. There are 1,300 crew members on board. And the chances of falling overboard on a cruise ship are not high. It is hard to fall off. So he had to really leap, probably. But in any case, That's two horrible. cruise ship passengers lost at sea in the last week. That is law and disorder for today. Tune in again next time for more Law and Disorder on The Mark Thompson Show. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out there. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.